we're going to start talking about linear models. Before we get into the linear models, let's uh, just take a, a brief look at where we are. Um, we've looked at supervised learning. This idea that we have instances that are assigned labels. We've talked about concepts. Concepts are these true functions that uh, um, we don't have access to, but we are hoping to approximate. And hypotheses are the functions that our learner produces. And any learning, any supervised learning algorithm has the same signature. It takes some label data and also hyperparameters which are not shown here. All of this goes into the learning algorithm and out comes a hypothesis, more commonly called a model. The hypothesis is a function. It can take new examples and assign labels and make predictions of it. So the learner is a function that takes a data set and produces a function, namely the hypothesis. The hypothesis is a function that takes an example and produces a label. We've looked at one specific learner and one specific hypothesis class, namely the decision tree uh, class and uh, the ID3 algorithm. There are, of course, there are other learners also. There are other hypotheses and there are other learners. We also looked at a couple of general machine learning ideas that uh, will come handy pretty much everywhere. One of them is this idea that you can represent examples, instances as features, which are high dimensional vectors. Just a list of attributes. Instead of keeping my email as a string, I can keep it as a set of features. And the features are the input to the learner, not the email itself, uh, actually to the hypothesis. The other high level uh, machine learning idea that we've encountered is this uh, uh, idea of overfitting that we just discussed. Before we move on to linear models, any questions about this high level picture? The five That's right. High dimensional vectors is just a complicated way of saying many, many features. So they all use one, one D. One each dimension for each container. Exactly. Yes. It's a big array of numbers. Yes. Functions. Concepts are the true function. The the oracle concept, oracle true function, the one that the target function, the one that we don't have access to, but we wish to approximate. Okay. Um, as long as we are all on this page, let's move on. This unit is going to talk about linear models, and uh, we we'll spend some time talking about what kinds of functions linear classifiers can express. Let's start about. Let's start talking about linear models. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about linear classifiers and linear regressors. And the nice thing about this class of functions is that they have a neat geometric interpretation. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about. A notational simplification that at this point will seem very, very, very annoying, but uh, it will save us from potential bugs later on, uh, both in the algorithms that I present and in code that you might write. And then I'll talk about uh, general, uh, 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 you know, general lay of the land for learning linear classifiers before talking about expressiveness. One of the earlier lectures I said. It, learning is not going to be is a fruitless exercise because the number of possible functions is extremely large. And any finite set of examples that we encounter, like here, still leaves out many different examples that could have arbitrary labels. So we can't tell upfront without making the assumption what those labels might be. Because if you choose a particular function that makes certain choices for those question marks, maybe nature is adversarial and says, oh, you are, all your choices are wrong. So you got the wrong function. Maybe nature is adversarial. The only way in which you can actually find the true function is if nature reveals every one of those question marks. You might say there are only 16 rows here. So there, you know, there are four features, 16 rows. I can remember 16 things. Right? But that's because we have four features. If you have 100 features that are all Boolean, you'll have two power 100 rows, 
no hope for nature to wait, wait, no hope waiting for nature to reveal all of that. And what makes things worse is if you have two power hundred, uh, um, if you have hundred features, the number of possible Boolean functions is two power two power hundred, which is a ridiculous number. So basically, learning seems hopeless, and the only uh, the only way forward is to make some sort of assumption. We've already made an assumption with the decision tree. It said, yeah, decision trees can represent all Boolean functions. Let's not grow the tree all the way to the full depth. Truncate it. Implicitly, what we're doing is I'm not going to explore the set of all possible Boolean functions because I'm restricting the tree to be small. Another uh, hypothesis space, another assumption here is so is, is a different class of functions that are called linear models. It's a hypothesis space assumption. How many people have encountered linear models in some capacity before? And what fraction of this is regression? And what fraction of that is classification? Okay, good. Um, good for all possible outcomes. If you've not seen it, that's great because you're going to see something cool. If you've seen it already, that's awesome. Uh, maybe people who have not seen who have not seen linear classifiers before. Imagine that uh, you have a data set with circles and triangles. This is your training data, and your goal is to separate the blue triangle, no, the blue circle from the red triangle. And let's say I give you two possible uh, class, uh, two possible classifiers. One of them is this curve A. Curve A is fantastic. Look, it gets every training example right. Line B makes some mistakes. The question is, which one do you prefer? Oh, by the way, the way this works is uh, it basically splits the uh, uh, space into two sides. One side is blue, the other side is red. So the question is, which of these do you prefer? And to answer this, I, I want you to think about concepts like, oh, what happened? I don't see a question. Oh, it's probably a private question to you. Okay. So, what do you prefer? Um, those of you who have not seen linear classifiers before, or even otherwise, yes. Why? That's right. The, the curve runs the risk of overfitting. You could argue. You know what? This seems uh, this seems unfair uh, because there are you know it's fitting all these points well. So how could you how do you know it's overfitting? Then I would argue. Then I would my counter argument would be you know what? Maybe there's a new data point here. Let's say you have a learning algorithm that can find that searches over the space of all possible curves to find one that perfectly classifies the data. Maybe there's a red triangle here, and my learning algorithm will do this. And then you'll say, yeah, you know what? Maybe there, a new data point comes in and it adds a blue circle right here. Uh, now, this is going to be a fun exercise. But you can keep doing this. You can keep drawing complicated curves that fit any data, which, I mean, you'd argue that this thing uh, is not a good uh, fit, right? It almost feels like the black, the red triangle that I drew and the blue circle that I drew are probably noisy data points. They are just there by accident. So it's okay to ignore them, or maybe it's okay to not get them right during training. So, in general, not in, in you know, the general uh, point here is that no matter how complicated a data set you have, you can find a curve that perfectly separates positives from negatives. As long as you allow the curve to get arbitrarily complex, the most complex version would be you put little circles around all the positive examples and say everything inside the circle is positive and could be perfect. So, on the other hand, the line runs the risk of what is called underfitting. It doesn't perfectly explain the data, it is not expressive enough. So, you know, there's a choice to be made, and I would prefer line B as well. Question? Uh, so, uh, 
it can and that's a risk with uh, uh the question is what if your uh, general model ends up embedding the outliers also that's the risk that we have the same sort of an argument can be made for regression let's say you have these data points remember regression is about predicting real numbers so here i have some value x and i need to predict what value uh, f takes so let's say you have curve A that goes through all the data points perfectly and line B that, oh, actually it goes through one data point perfectly. Um, and the same question, do you prefer line B or curve A? The answer is, it may be a good, a good idea to prefer line B because no matter how complex your data set gets, you can always find a curve that fits the, the data set. You can imagine uh, uh, creating a really, really complicated polynomial, for example. Linear regression might make smaller errors on future points because it generalizes better. Um, sometimes people get confused between regression and classified and classification if you've not seen it before. Uh, remember that regression is about predicting real valued numbers, real valued outputs. Classification is about predicting discrete outputs. Classification, the prototypical example is binary classification where you have two outputs, um, spam and not spam. And in uh, regression, you're predicting real numbers. Let me give you an example of a linear classifier. Imagine that uh, uh, you're trying to decide whether a certain robot arm is defective or not. And to do that, you're taking two measurements. Uh, one of them is the maximum distance that the arm can reach. And the second one is the maximum angle it can rotate. Okay. And let's say using some something that you know about the domain, you've decided that uh, the arm is defective if, if two times d plus 0.01 times a mm -hmm. is more than seven. Don't ask me what these numbers mean. I'm just I just made them up. Now a new uh, arm comes in. You run some tests and you find that d equals three and a equals two hundred. You can plug in those values. You get the number eight. Eight is more than seven. You decide that the uh, did I make a mistake here? Yeah, it should be defective, right? Eight is more than seven. So in this case, it would be defective. Um, the, it, this is the general uh, way in which all linear classifiers work. You have a set of features. In this case, there are two features, A and B. You assign a certain real valued weight for each feature. In this case, you have two and 0.01. You have a certain threshold, seven. In the uh, in the literature, the threshold is called a bias term, and you check if the weighted uh, uh, the, the the weighted features when add when added up cross the threshold or not. If they cross the threshold, you have one label. If they don't cross the threshold, you have the other label. This is a general sort of a, a, a sketch for all linear classifiers. The the features are weighted. They are added up. The sum is checked against the threshold, and based on whether the threshold is crossed or not, you get two labels. Questions about this uh, general scheme? The next thing that I'll do is I'll just take this exact thing and replace all the details with abstract uh, symbols. Let's uh, define this more generally. Input now, and I think pretty much always going ahead for the rest of the semester, are d dimensional feature vectors. We are no longer going to think of inputs as emails or images or something. Let's say that somebody did the feature extraction for us, and we have d features. Together, I'm almost always going to use the letter x to denote input, bold x. The output is a label. We're talking about binary classification. The output's a label. It can either be a minus one or a plus one. A linear threshold unit is the classifier that we hope to learn. It classifies this example in the following way. It contains inside it parameters w. w is also a d-dimensional vector. What that means is w has as many real numbers as x has. So w is a d-dimensional vector, and b is a single number. A real number is the bias or threshold uh, that we have. 
And the output of this linear threshold unit is you first take the dot product of W and X. Taking the dot product of two vectors gives you a number. And then you add this bias term and you see whether this thing is positive or negative. The dot product of two vectors is simply for every feature Xi, I multiply it with the corresponding weight Wi. I add up all these things. And then to that, I add the bias term. So I get Wi Xi sum over that plus V. All of this is going to give me a single number. If that number is positive, then I predict the label plus one. If that number is negative, then I predict the label minus one. Here B is called the bias term. Questions about linear classifiers. This is just a mechanical uh, explanation of what it does. I've not told you why this is a good idea. I've not told you whether this makes sense or not. This is what it does. What I have actually done here is essentially introduce you to this hypothesis space. Anytime you encounter a new class of functions that hopefully your learner will uh, uh, navigate, you need to ask yourself, first, how does it work? How do you make predictions with it? Here, the answer is internally, it contains weights and bias. And I just take the dot product of the weights with my example, add the bias, look at the sign. Ask me questions. This is perhaps the simplest sort of a decision rule that you can think of. I have a bunch of features. I need to assign one weight or importance for each feature, then sum them up. And if the total score crosses some threshold, then it applies. Yes. When you say sign on the slide, you like plus or minus. That's right. Uh, plus one or minus one. Yeah. Uh, I used to earlier call, use the SGN, this is the Latin signum function, but turns out nobody cares. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's just use that. Mm -hmm. There's a question. Can we think of the bias term uh, like the intercept in o OLS? OLS is ordinary least squares. The answer is absolutely yes. It behaves like the intercept uh, in uh, for any line. In fact, it's very useful to think about the geometry of a linear classifier. Uh, and here I'm going to illustrate this in two dimensions and then just kind of appeal to your intuitions to extrapolate this to three dimensions and more. So in two dimensions, two dimensions means we just have two features. We have, imagine we have this feature X1 and feature X2. So I have a plane. I can write, I can draw planes on the whiteboard, so that's convenient or on the screen, I guess. And every example in this space corresponds to a pair of uh, a point in the space. Every instance is a d dimensional, a two dimensional vector, which is basically a point. So this is a positive example and this is a negative example. A linear classifier can be thought of as if each feature x1 and x2 have a weight w1, w2. You add them up and then there's a bias and you have the sign. This is the mechanical version of it, but notice that V plus W on X1 plus W2 X2 corresponds to a line. It's almost the equation of a line. When you set it to equal to zero, that's the line, right? I mean, this, this should not be shocking to people. Your silence worries me. Okay, I'm assuming that uh, this is not shocking and you're just embarrassed into silence. Excellent point. W, okay, let's go to the X first. X represents the example, the instances. So this example maybe is, so let's say X1, this is uh, one and two, this corresponds to the, let's call this X1. Or I can't use X1, then. let's say X, the vector is one, two. X represents the features. Ws, represent the parameters that define the line, represent the classifier. The Ws and the B together represent the classifier. Different classifiers have different Ws and Bs. So the job of the learner eventually is given a data set, figure out the best W and the best C. 
in some sense, they in two dimensions, they define something like the slope. But in higher dimensions, it's no longer quite uh, uh, that straightforward. So I prefer not to think of it that way. I just think of it as a weight associated, W is for weight, a weight associated for each feature. So when I say W1, X1 plus W2, X2 plus B, that gives me a real number. When that number is equal to zero, that corresponds to a line. Now, the cool thing about that line is in two dimensions, if I draw a line, the line partitions the plane into two slices. Imagine this line is going all the way infinitely, extends to infinity on both sides. It partitions the plane into two sides. And we have two labels. What the linear classifier is essentially saying is, I'm going to split the plane into two. So I'm going to draw a, a line that partitions the plane into two parts. I'm going to designate one of those parts. I use an arrow to for that thing. I'm going to designate one of those parts as positive and the other side as negative. And that gives you the, the, the behavior of a, two, uh, of a linear classifier in two dimensions. This W here corresponds to the normal vector associated with that line. It's, it's this thing here. If, you're, if this seems immediately obvious to you, that's good. If not, don't worry about it. Importantly, we only care about the sign of W transpose X plus B. We really don't care about the actual number. So in this point here I said was uh, one comma two. And I like writing vectors as columns. Uh, some people prefer writing them as rows. Uh, doesn't really matter. If this point is one comma two, and let's say I have a certain linear classifier that assigns a score, I call this thing the score. And let's say for that point, the score is 17. There's a different linear classifier that assigns a score 170. It doesn't really matter because both of those are positive. All we care about is that 17 and 170 are both positive and that point gets labeled as a plus. We basically take the score, we threshold. This is in two dimensions. Let's think about three dimensions. What is a line in three dimensions? A plane. And uh, if you want to think about three dimensions, think of the room that we are in. Uh, points are basically points in this room. Some points are labeled plus, some points in a different place are labeled minus. And the linear classifier here is going to be a plane that slices through this room and says one side is plus and the other side is minus. That's in three dimensions. What is it in four dimensions? or 15 dimensions or 1000 dimensions. We don't have names for each one. About three, we just call it hyperplanes. Hyperplanes are just the generalization of a plane. It's just a hyperplane is nothing but something that looks like a plane, but in higher dimensions. Now, you could ask me, what does it mean to look like a plane in higher dimensions? I don't know. I mean, at this point, I'm just thinking algebra here. But uh, it behaves essentially in the same way. It's slices the region into two set parts and says one side is positive, the other side is negative. And it, you know, the, the, I usually like to draw an arrow which represents the normal, which points to the positive side. And the two pieces uh, that the hyperplanes, uh, you know, separate, they are called half spaces. For each half space is assigned a label. Any questions? How many people have seen hyperplanes before or heard of them? How many people can kind of visualize hyperplanes? Did you have a question or no? How many people visualize hyperplanes? I please teach me. So, uh, Right. I think in some sense, everyone who's worked with hyperplanes has their own sort of mental models of how to work with them. But imagining them kind of gives a headache. Um, there's an old uh, sort of a mathematician joke which says, uh, how do you imagine n-dimensional space? 
Well, you, you imagine n minus one dimensions and add one. Uh, you start with two, the base case of two. Um, anyway, uh, the, I, I don't know if that's necessarily funny, so let's move on. Uh, are there any questions about this? Any questions about the geometry of uh, a linear classifier? The, the short answer is a linear classifier corresponds to a hyperplane that slices the the instance space because this, the, this represents the instance space that slices the instance space into two half spaces and designates one side as positive and the other side as negative. Next thing is I'm going to introduce a little bit of, uh, I'm going to simplify some notation by what is going to seem like a tedious process. So remember that a linear classifier is completely defined by W, the weight vector. W, I, I will always call W the weight vector. So the linear classifier is defined by the weight vector W and a bias term B. So you always have to carry these two things around to define the linear classifier. And uh, while mathematically this is complete and this is all we need, when we are writing code, it's often possible that you might end up forgetting to add the B. Or it's possible that you might subtract the B instead of adding the B in one place and all that. Um, so here's a sort of a notational trick that allows you to stop writing the B at every step. So the prediction function is sum over Wi xi plus B, which is not, which is the same as the or the sign of that, which is the same as the sign of W transpose x plus B. Remember that x is a vector which which has multiple dimensions. Let's say we have d dimensions. Each of these is a real number. And I'm, I usually write the dimensionality here. So you have d dimensional vectors. <laughs> and w is another d dimensional vector. Right? This is the object that we have. Instead of that, let's say that I'm going to rewrite x as the original x plus the number one at the bottom, which is this, x1, xd, and the number one. So I have d things here, and this one thing here, so it is d plus one. I can rewrite, I'm going to call this x prime. And I'm going to write w prime the same way, w1, wd, and I'm going to stick the bias term at the bottom. So b. So this is also a d plus one dimensional vector. Does the construction make sense? Yes. Everyone tell me what happens next. Or, yes. Without actually act actively doing it. So, importantly, think of what's the dot product of x prime and w prime. The dot product of x prime and w prime is I'm multiplying these two together, these two together, these two. So it is w1 x1 plus w2 x2 wd xd plus b, which is exactly the same as this thing here, right? But by just remembering x prime and w prime, I don't need to actively carry a b around. By adding one extra dimension, what have I actually done here? Remember that my x's are features, right? I have d features to begin with. I added one more feature here at the bottom. That one more feature is a constant. It always takes the value one. I'm essentially adding another column in my data set, which always takes the value one. And I just run my learning algorithm and I get this for free. So that's the important point here is W transpose x plus b is the same as W prime transpose x prime. And I can write prediction as the sign of that new dot product. This increases the dimensionality by one. And basically, it's, uh, it's equivalent to adding one extra feature to every data point. In practice, I would highly, highly encourage you to uh, do this. In any homework that you have going ahead, you'll be implementing algorithms for linear classifiers. Just Add an extra feature. You read that you can inc incorporate this at the time your data is being read. If your data has D features, you just add one extra feature which has the value one. 
and then give it to the learning algorithm, you get the bias term for free. In the, this, I want you, I am not going to explain this, but I want you to think about this offline, but in the D plus one dimensional space, this new vector, the, the, the hyperplane corresponding to that new vector goes through the origin. <laughs> so for the most part, in this class, I will hide the bias term D. Sometimes I'll actually change it explicitly when there are reasons to doing for doing that. And instead, I'm going to just hide the bias and I, I, I pretend that there's this extra constant feature. But always remember that the bias term exists. Because adding the bias term, remove if, what will happen if I remove this bias term here? If I remove it. In two dimensions, it's easy to explain. I have W1, X1 plus W2, X2. Let's say we set it equal to zero. What kinds of lines are those? Lines goes through the origin, right? So the only lines that we are allowing are lines like this. What if your data set sits here? All the pluses are here and the minuses are here. A line that goes through the origin is not going to separate, cannot separate. Them. So even though, of course, I can draw a line that separates the pluses and the minuses. So it's important to have the bias term because not having the bias term makes the model less expressive. Questions? We are almost at the end of today's lecture. So I'm going to just give you a preview of coming attractions. Um, we've talked about linear models. For a good part of the semester, we look at different learning algorithms for learning linear models. Sometime, maybe in a couple of weeks, we'll look at uh, an algorithm called Perceptron, which uh, uh, is an error-driven algorithm. And then after that, we'll kind of go into computational learning theory and then come back to an algorithm called the support vector machines, which is another algorithm for learning a linear classifier. Then we'll kind of veer away into other things and then go into Bayesian learning. We'll encounter naive Bayes. Turns out naive Bayes is a linear classifier also. And then we'll very quickly after that encounter logistic regression. Turns out logistic regression is also a linear classifier. All of these are just different named learning algorithms whose hypothesis space is the same. In all cases, after learning is done, the prediction rule is exactly what we've seen today. I'll stop here on uh, Tuesday. I'll start. Uh, I'll we'll start with by looking at the expressiveness of this class of functions. Don't forget your homework, please.